if we open up the heart again, we can appreciate how there's essentially four sets of valves. All these valves, incidentally, are part of what we call the cardiac skeleton, and the cardiac skeleton rests in the region of the atrioventricular groove. Let's take a look at this valve first. This one has essentially three little sacs that um, in effect fill with blood uh, while the heart is relaxing. So a relaxed heart is essentially going to be having a, a draw on the blood coming out of the pulmonary trunk. But as these sacs fill, it prevents backflow of blood into the right ventricle. However, when the ventricles contract, blood travels between the three sacs and that allows the blood to go upward. The sacs collapse and essentially the blood then travels into the pulmonary trunk. So this particular valve then is referred to as the pulmonary semilunar valve. Semilunar meaning uh, partial moon and there would be three partial moons then, these little sacs, one, two, and three. Okay, and this one has been removed. Um, since we're still on the right side of the heart, let's take a look at another valve that's traveling between the atria and the ventricle on the right side. And this is referred to as the tricuspid valve. Uh, the tricuspid valve, in contrast to the semilunar valve, is going to be open when the heart is relaxing and it's going to close when the heart contracts. So the semilunar valve opens with contraction and closes at relaxation. The tricuspid valve is going to essentially open at relaxation and close at contraction. Now these valves are regulated by these muscles here which are referred to as papillary muscles and the little strings that attach the valve to the papillary muscles are referred to as the cordi tendinii, cordi tendinii. We also see this kind of rough appearance, sort of gnarly musculature inside the, the ventricles, and these muscles are referred to as the trabeculae carni, literally the fleshy pillars, trabeculae carni. All right, so that's the right side of the heart. Let's go to the left side and we're going to see something very similar. Again we have a valve, but not a tricuspid valve in this case. We're going to call it a bicuspid valve. Another name for this is the mitral valve. It has two cusps rather than three. Again, the cordy tendinii are attached to papillary muscles and then the surrounding musculature on the interior of the ventricle is referred to as trabeculae carni. All right, one more thing we'll add to this. You can see on the interior of the left atrium, we have these little guys that look almost like sores uh, on this particular model. These are actually the entry points of the pulmonary veins. Remember, the pulmonary veins are carrying oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. So because the blood is coming from the lungs to the heart, these are veins. Here's the outside, there's the inside, right? Now, um, let's just review this one more time. This is the pulmonary trunk branching into two pulmonary arteries. There's a pulmonary artery on the left, pulmonary artery on the right. The pulmonary arteries are traveling to the left and right lungs. This is deoxygenated blood being sent by an artery because remember, in a way, arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. So pulmonary veins, pulmonary arteries. The term vein actually comes from the Latin word to come, venere. Let's take a look at some other muscles now. On the inside of the atria, we have these m little muscles as, that look as if somebody's taken a comb to them. They are called the pectinate muscles, and the term pectinate means comb. Now what will happen is the pectinate muscles will contract, allowing for blood that is accumulated into the atria to be forced into the ventricle, which allows the ventricle to expand. So forced down through the valve into the ventricle, allows the ventricle to expand some, which is again essentially provides mechanism for contraction thanks to the elastic properties of the heart. Um, we find the same circumstance on the left side as well, the pectinate muscles. If we take a look at the interior of the heart, we see this white disc 
The white disc is called the fossa oval, and um, essentially our fossa ovalis. And what this is is a flap of connective tissue that has closed a shunt that existed prior to birth between the right atrium and the left atrium. In effect, we do not need to send blood to the lungs uh, prior to birth, uh, and so because we're not breathing atmospheric air, we're getting all of our oxygen from our, our mother's venous blood. And so, uh, in effect, we have this shunt between the left and right heart. However, once we start breathing the atmospheric air, this needs to be closed up, and indeed it does. And this connective tissue then forms this little flap, which we can actually see, uh, again, called the fossa oval or fossa ovalis. We find a similar circumstance between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And this is this little structure here is called the ligamentum arteriosum. Again, this is a shunt between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk that allows for a mixing of blood on the right and left side prior to birth. This will collapse into essentially just a ligament uh, after birth. So blood stops passing through here shortly after birth. All right, let's take a look at a few um, what I call auxiliary vessels. Um, these two here are brachiocephalic veins that feed into the superior vena cava. So we have a right brachiocephalic vein and a left brachiocephalic vein. Now these two are essentially veins that are draining both the head and neck as well as the arms. All right, brachiocephalic, arm and head, right? Good. Now if we go here to the aorta, we see these little prongs sticking up off of here that represent, once again, arteries. Uh, this particular one is the left subclavian artery, followed by the left common carotid artery. And then the one off to the right side is the right brachiocephalic artery. The brachiocephalic artery is, is receiving blood from the right common carotid as well as the right subclavian arteries. We don't see those two arteries here though. This has been cropped so that we don't see that. But notice that all the brachiocephalics are together, the two brachiocephalic veins and the brachiocephalic artery. There's only one of these. Uh, remember, the left subclavian artery and the left common carotid artery drain directly into the, I should say drain, um, receive blood directly from the aorta, whereas the brachiocephalic artery receives blood from the aorta and will send blood then to the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. All right, well I think that almost does it. There's one more little vein that I see real quick. This is the azygous vein. This is essentially draining blood around the rib cage. So this is the azygous vein draining then in this particular um, region and it's draining into, as you can see, the superior vena cava. All right, well, that's good. So I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, so best of luck.